Welcome to another episode of Speak Up, the television arm of Freemasonry in New Zealand. I am Barry Rushton, your host, and we have an enlightened show for you this evening. My first guest is a young Freemason. He's the master of his lodge in Oriwa. He is going to tell us about why young men are joining Freemasonry. My second guest is the oldest member of that same lodge, Mr. Harry Camish. He's nearly 96 and as sharp as a tack. And he's going to tell us a story about when he, their bomber got shot down over France and he escaped through Spain back to England. A wonderful story. Rounding out the program, of course, is our regular contributor, Graham Houston. Craig McFarlane, nice to see you. It's a pleasure to be here, Barry. Great to have a young Freemason on the show now. I know that we could be, you know, we could be called to be just having an old people sort of organisation, but it's far from that. It's Winston serious. Churchill something, said something in the 20th century. He said that Freemasonry's got a lot to offer the 20th century more than the 20th century's got to offer Freemasonry. And I'm sure that's pretty much the same today. So what makes young guys like yourself join Freemasonry? Well, I think, Barry, it's an individual... Um individual pursuit. Uh, now initially I started off, uh, Freemasonry was very um, entrenched in my family. My grandfather was a Freemason and so was my father and my uncle. <coughs> um, and growing up I, we, we knew about it. Um, the kids and the cousins all knew about Freemasonry but it was never spoken about. Um, and it wasn't until I left the Navy and an old former Navy colleague of mine um, approached me one day and says, um, what do you know about Freemasonry? And I sat back and I said, probably a bit more than you'll give me credit for. Uh, and the rest is history. Great. Um, but it's, it's helped me a lot. Um, and I think any young person who's sort of trying to find their feet in the world, perhaps, um, I think Freemasonry's got a very lot to offer in terms of how we conduct ourselves both as a, as a person uh, and, our, and our professional lives as well. See, I know your lodge has initiated a number of younger people. Are you still finding that's the same sort of connection that they're looking for themselves? Not necessarily historically with their family, but they're actually searching for something part of belonging, do you think? Yes, that's correct. And also there's, um, as you are aware, um, Freemasonry's got a long history and a, a lot of tradition. And I think a lot of um, the younger brethren, as we call them, that are coming through are sort of, sort of looking for that and trying to connect to something along those lines. You see, I think that's a very good point because it does seem to, cons I have a number of younger children too. and, and you know, sometimes you say to yourself, gee, I'm glad I'm not a young kid today or even trying to start a young family. They've got huge pressures on them. They've got lots of different distractions. They sort of look around. There's all these new fandangle gadgets. They've got pressure on them. They've got, you know, they can't get a mortgage or get a house. There's lots of things that go on. And it seems like even in communities, there's tension, you know. So why do you think, um, what, what, what makes a young man seek for some of these old-fashioned values that Freemasonry espouses? I think uh, it's trying to connect back to um, the roots of being a person. Um, Freemasonry offers a, a lot of very good things in terms of making what we consider good men better. Um, modern society, I believe, doesn't cater for that anymore. Um, we're so bent by, as you said, social pressures, um, that there's nothing to sort of hold on to or nothing to connect to. Freemasonry sort of stops time, if you like, um, and allows us to reconnect not only with ourselves, but um, with the members of the Lodge as well. I'm finding also too that there's sort of a need amongst men of all kind <coughs> that, there's, that they, they need to actually uh, do some good in the communities that they live in. There's, there's a basic intrinsic need there, especially it was in, in my age group. Are you finding the same thing with the younger ones? Do they want to get behind stuff? And definitely, definitely. And that's what something that Freemasonry offers as well, is a very strong charity focus. Um, and it's a good, good feel good uh, when you, you put something together, you see it through and you look at the benefits at the end. Um, and it's really, really good to see that and to help the community as well. Quite so. You know, in the, in the Freemasons meetings, you know, a lot of things are done on, on, in ritual. And in those ritual, rituals, there are great moral truths, you know. I mean, is there something, I know there is, yep. but is there something <laughs> that sits with these young kids, or young men, I should say, with regards to things of value, moral value, moral truth, being, being I would treat you as I want you to treat me. Is that what they're looking for as well? That's right. And um, one of the morals is brotherly love, relief, and truth. Um, and basically what that, that says is that I'll be true to myself, I'll be true to my, my fellow um, brethren, if you like, as well as um, my community. Um, and that's something that I think is very, very important. Um, and that's what Freemasonry teaches you once you start stripping everything back. Great. You see, um, you could say that, that Freemasonry is an association of men who believe in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. In saying that, 
How would you interpret <coughs> those two statements? So um, the fatherhood of God. I think Freemasonry um, does ask us to believe in a superior being, um, and, and that's it. Um, but it, is not a, it doesn't discriminate against any form of religion. Um, and I've sat in the lodge rooms with um, people from the Jewish faith and from the, the Muslim faith as well. Um, and I'm very privileged to have done that. There's no, um, no conception, no, no issues around that as, as well. So. And so with regards to the brotherhood, I mean, is, we know also that there's an obligation. I mean, with, with comes responsibility comes an obligation. Yes. Right? And that obligation is not just to you and, the, and, the, and your fellow brethren. It's to whom else? It's to your... It's, it's also to our family. Yeah. Um, and that's something that we, we tend to forget. But um, our family is a very big... Um, supporter of Freemasonry. Um, without them, as I say, without them nothing, because if my wife and my kids don't support me in my journey, uh, then what's the point of going out? Mm, quite so, quite so. Part of the Freemasonry event evening is the social side, yes. is the refectory after the meeting. That's where, of course, uh, everybody gets together and they have a bit of time together. With the demands on younger people, you know, and the, and the range of entertainment that they can go to, can, can be a part of, what is the strong part about you joining in the refectory, <coughs> talking to uh, men of, of um, equal stature, if I can say that yep. term, as a brother? Um, what's the bit that you really love out of Freemasonry in the refectory aspect? That social connection um, and that one-on-one -on -one or that face time is, is maybe more than people might uh, believe in. I think too many... Uh, well, too many times now, we're, we're all pinned to our, our mobile devices um, and whilst social media's got a lot to offer, um, it doesn't give me that experience um, to have that conversation um, and to actually engage with, with other men, if you like, yeah. um, on both a professional and a um, social level. Now, I know that you are active in Freemasonry. <coughs> I think this is your third term, as, as, or not third term, or third time as master. Now, that's good for a young guy because you, you have to do the things through the, through the uh, system before you become yes. a master. What's the one enduring thing, if you can sort of pull it out of there, that makes you stay involved? I enjoy it. Wow. I enjoy it. And it also gives me, I don't use this word lightly, a sense of belonging. Um, I always feel welcome. I feel welcome whether I'm in the lodge in Auckland, whether I'm in the lodge in Taranaki, um, or even in Christchurch, I always feel welcome. Um, so I guess it's that sense of belonging. But most of all, I enjoy it. Great stuff. Well, Craig, it's been great having you on the show. Young men like you, there's a lot of them in Freemasonry, and I really appreciate you taking the time for being here. And thank you for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thank you. From one of the youngest members of Lodge Arewa to perhaps the most senior member of them all, Harry Kamish. It is an absolute delight to have you here, sir. Nice to be here. Bro. Oh, it's good. Sir, you're nearly 96. Yes. You're as sharp as a tack, which I came up the other day and had a chat to you for about an hour and a half. I wanted to stay for about three hours, but I had to get back home. <laughs> but it was a delight. And you've been 50 years in Freemasonry. Congratulations, my 53, friend. 53, actually, yes. 53? 50, 53. 53. Yes, I but, joined in 65. That's fantastic. We'll come to that in a moment or two. Mm. You've made some contributions to a book which I regret I didn't have with me, but I'm going to put a shot up, and it's called Kiwis Can Fly, and it's a collection of, I think, all aviator stories from New Zealand of the time in the Second World War. Is that correct? That's correct. And you've got a couple of beauties in there. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Now, we talk about World War II, and this discussion tonight has nothing to do with the horrors of war that, that you went through that we only could know about. But there are some amusing stories in there, Harry, and I want to chuck you into that. I want our viewers to, to have the laughter that I had at your house about two or three days ago. So I want to chuck you in it. I want you to tell us again about the, the crash on takeoff of your Lancaster bomber. Well, <clears throat> we were just a new crew arrived at the station. And uh, in the training stations, you don't practice with a full bomb load. When you get onto an operational station, of course, you've got another 12,000 pounds of weight to consider. <clears throat> and our pilot was a young and experienced pilot, like they all were. And uh, I was a flight engineer. I yep. operated the throttles and such forth. And uh, unfortunately, the, the Lancaster has a tendency to swing to the port, which is <laughs> left. the left hand side right there. <clears throat> and once you've lost control, that's it. <laughs> you, you can't get back on the runway. And uh, we headed for a hangar, and as you're heading for the hangar at 
nearly 100 miles an hour, <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, what's my mother going to think about this? <laughs> Anyhow, we caught, we caught the hangar with our port wing <clears throat> and spun round and the Lancaster broke in two with the rear gunner in his turret being fed with the hydraulic oil and he was, he was a blaze in the turret. <clears throat> and as I say, I can't remember exactly what happened, but uh, I finished up running across the aerodrome, over the perimeter fence, and out into the village, uh, down into the village and knocking on the door of the first cottage that I came to. And this elderly gentleman came to the door <clears throat> and I said, I've just come from an explode, a bomber which is going to explode any minute, which of course put real panic into the old fella. Anyhow, he, um, he invited him in. His wife said, would you like a cup of tea? And I, I learned all this afterwards because <laughs> I was in a state of shock. I was in a state of shock. Uh, she invited him in for a cup of tea and the old gentleman went down to the local con policeman, which was just one fella. And he came back and he said, and where are you from, son? I said, I'm from RAF Skellingthorpe. And what's happened? I said, we've, we've crashed and there's a fun bomb boat going to go off any minute now, which of course caused a bit of panic to the old gentleman. So he rode back on his bicycle to phone, up, to phone up the <laughs> Skellingthorpe and he said, I think we've got one of your crew members here. Well, secrecy is the main thing on the aerodrome. And they said, oh, what is he? And he said, oh, I don't know. Well, you better go back and see what he is. <laughs> so the, the policeman came back and said, what are you, son? I said, I'm the engineer. <laughs> oh, right. And off he went back to phone up the station and tell them that th there was the engineer. And he said, I heard them at the other end say, we found the engineer. He's down in this village about so many miles away, which of course <laughs> caused great consternation. But uh, eventually the blood wagon arrived and I went into the military hospital. And, and the plane did in actual fact blow up, right? The did plane it? went up about 50 minutes later while I was still in later. the hospital. And a the big military. hole in the ground, right? A big hole in the ground, very much so. See, we can only picture these sort of stories, but as, yeah. as kids, we used to get the war comics, you know, and yeah. they were so beautifully drawn, you yes. know, and, and you can just picture this Bobby yeah. on his bike, you yeah. know, cycling back with the hat yeah. on and the helmet, yeah. coming back, and so proper, you know, yeah. so proper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, things are slightly different in wartime. <laughs> now, again, the, the other story that, that I, I want you to jump right into this one, excuse the pun, of course, right, but I yeah. want to know the time that you bailed out. Now, I know yeah. you, you, you're on a sortie, I believe, and you got yeah. shot. Yes, down, right? yeah. This is a fabulous story. Well, this, this is another case. When I came out of the hospital, I was assigned as spare bod. In other words, a spare bod is a spare engineer. So I, it was not a very nice job at all because I had to replace any engineer in another crew that was probably sick or something like that. Well, crews are very much family affairs and any newcomer into a crew isn't really welcomed yeah. until he's proved his worth. So. I, I didn't really enjoy the next few operations uh, <clears throat> and I was thinking about going out to Lincoln Village to enjoy the few beers in the Saracen's Head. Everybody in Lincoln will know the Saracen's Head. And a uh, call came over the town, I report for duty, you're flying tonight and so that was it. I had to get ready to, for another operation which was my 16th. And uh, I got Funny enough, all the other flights I've been with, I felt okay. But with this one, I was slightly uneasy. But wow. there's nothing you can do about it. You, yeah. You've got to go, and so off we went. And uh, <clears throat> we're we're about uh, what 20 minutes off our target uh, in southern Germany, and we got hit by the night fighter, and we went down in flames. It was every man for himself, and. <clears throat> I, uh, we, we have the front escape hatch, which, which is very small, it would be about two, yes, very small indeed. Mm -hmm. And when you've got your parachute harness on and everything, it's very difficult to get out of. And the bomber, who was the first one out, was jumping on the door and his weight, he was a big man, but his weight wouldn't do the door. And the pilot was getting quite anxious because we were just <laughs> going, going down, down right? faster and faster and gravity pulling on gravity was very heavy on the body. And anyhow, the bomb aimer disappeared and I floated out after him, jumped on it and, uh, and landed in about two feet of snow. 
<clears throat> in the middle of a paddock, right? And How and lucky was you, that? You, you think that the Germans waiting for you with bayonets and rifles and all, all sorts of thoughts go through my mind. Am I going to land in a tree? Am I going to land on a steeple with a nice spire <laughs> sticking up you know where? <laughs> and all these things float through your head and then when you hit the ground with a, a bump, you feel quite relieved. Mm, I bet. <clears throat> and uh, we were almost told to get as far away as possible from, from where we landed, so I took to my heels and headed west. You want to turn off the train? And you buried the you I buried, buried the parachute, buried the parachute yeah. in the snow, yes. Buried the parachute in the snow. And we, we were issued with a suede type of flying boot, which isn't very good for walking. And <clears throat> I headed west and got to this railway line. And I heard a boop, boop, boop in the <laughs> distance. And I thought, ah, a train. What better way to get away from the, to jump on the train? So I. I'm standing by the railway tracks and this train went by about 80 miles an hour <laughs> and the blast blew me off my feet. <laughs> so that, 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 was, that was a no-no. Um, I, I walked a considerable length of time and, uh, and eventually came to a small village, well, a railway station mainly, and uh, <clears throat> I walked into the door and the poor old station master was looked up at me with full uniform on and he, he knew immediately what I was because they always heard the aircraft going overhead. And uh, he took me into the little village and uh, I got um, into this little two-bedroom cottage with this, uh, well I think he must have been a farm labourer and his wife, and uh, I stayed there uh, for three days. Right. Uh, <coughs> and there was always, there was just two rooms in there the, ma the main room was the big bedroom with a, a massive king, what we call a king size bread today. And I stayed there for three days and the question is, what position were you in the bed, in the middle or on the <laughs> outside? <laughs> because the people, apparently the people in the railway stations, they, they were quite sympathetic to um, well, English I, flyers, weren't I they? Didn't, I didn't know it at the time, but the French had several escape lines which they picked up down there, man, like this. Yeah. There was a lot going down in those days. They picked up down there and then they sent you along the escape route, you see, so I was, um, <clears throat> but the problem here was uh, when one of, uh, I was in this cottage and when this gentleman came to the door and in, in perfect English, he, he asked me what squadron I was on, where I was going, what target it was, and I realized, and I had to explain to him that I didn't really know the names of the crew, <laughs> which made him very suspicious. suspicious yeah. And I said, no, I was a spare engineer, and I'm, I know the name of the pilot, but not on the other crew. Anyhow, he, he went off and he came back the next day. Everything must have been okay. They must have been in touch with England. And, and I was accepted. And <coughs> funnily enough, out in the little square outside this little village was a notice on the, on the wall, $10,000 reward, a 10,000 francs, francs yeah. reward for any airman Report. Wow. They knew we were in the vicinity and they were searching for us. You know. So what a temptation for someone to turn you in. 10,000 francs was a yeah. lot of money to villagers, poor villagers. And yeah. yet they knew I was there, the rest of the village knew I was there. And they used to make any excuse to come in and uh, say, have a look at this, you. Have a look at this English <laughs> So airman. you finally got some papers there. You were, you were then from, from there I went to, <coughs> to the next town and uh, it was a couple of ladies, middle-aged ladies, that had a, a form of dress shop. I stayed with them for a while, while I got uh, these false papers printed. Yep. And uh, they got me down as Louis Blanc, <laughs> and I was a painter from some, some, some little town. Town. And then I was passed along the routes, with quite a lot of events happened along the routes. In, in one place I stayed with um, a high police official, funnily enough. He, he had the key to the local armory and he said that when the, when our boys arrive, he'd unlock the armory and give it out okay. to the... <laughs> so you, uh, you got up to about Paris, right? Then you actually got well, a train down to Toulouse, right? Yes, I got, I got to Paris and, uh, and stayed with... Uh, I had a good look at um, the Eiffel Tower from where I was in, in okay. Paris. <laughs> and from there, I went down to Toulouse, then across to the foot of the Pyrenees, the, yeah. and then over the Pyrenees, which... I was on my own at that particular stage because uh, the group I was with had been betrayed and uh, we were surrounded by... This is at the base of the this Pyrenees, This is at right? the base of yep. the Pyrenees, yeah. 
and we'd, they'd been betrayed and uh, I, uh, I was unfortunate to break away in the right direction. Da race off, right? Race off, yeah, with the bullets and the dogs barking <laughs> and every goddamn noise under the sun. It's the, over the Pyrenees in the, in the cold and the dark and yes, there's in funny little shoes and boots that you had on in, the clothes, in a, right? In a, in, a, in a railway porter's suit yeah, and, yeah. and real thin shoes, yes. And, and you see them today with all this gear to go over the mountains, that's all I had. So, so you eventually got down into Spain? I got into, into Spain, yeah. whereas once I got over the mountains, uh, the embassy, the British Embassy, someone phoned the British Embassy yeah. to say there was an airman. From that moment onwards, it was all... Handed down. All yeah. handed, oh and yes. Did you bolt right and then back home? Gibraltar and home, yeah. and, uh, and when I got to Gibraltar, that's when my mother got the telegram to say, your son was, will sooner be arriving in England what after 13 weeks what a great, waiting to what see a what happened to joy. him. He's still alive and kicking. What a fantastic story. I know you have other ones too. We would run out of time, but there's yes. one other question I would love to ask you. I know that you would have enjoyed the camaraderie of the, of the soldiers at the time. It's just that's yeah. what happened. Yeah. Was that one of the things that sort of made you gravitate towards Freemasonry? Actually, when you actually the experience I had there made me very community minded, Great. my wife and I. And when we came to England, we, um, when we came to New Zealand, I mean, I joined the RSA, yep. I joined the Lions Club, and eventually I was accepted into Freemasonry. Um, and the thing about Freemasonry I found was uh, uh, that they did an, all this vast amount of work that never saw publicity. Yeah, which is great, isn't it? And, and I, was, I was quite taken, yes, taken I met, by that. I met some really fine men on their wives in Freemasonry. Harry, thank you very much, mate. It's been great having you as a special guest. I'm going to come up to your house again some stage soon, and mm. we're going to go over a few more stories. Yeah, well, bring the beer with you. <laughs> <laughs>
know that many of the military uh, regiments that came and travelled overseas travelled with what they call travelling warrants, Masonic warrants, and that allowed them to set up uh, Masonic lodges. He was responsible for creating five new lodges for the Irish constitution throughout New Zealand. That's there was Sin Lodge, Oni Hunger Lodge, Ilfa uh, Waikato, Beta Waikato, and he wow. was involved with the create, consecration of the Shamrock Lodge down in, in Dunedin. And if you look at the commonality of those lodges, you will find most of those had military connections. They were based, they were set up mainly for the servicemen. In fact, Within three months of him arriving in Auckland, he joined the Elf, uh, the Ara Lodge in Auckland here, and the records show that in pursuing the interests of the servicemen, he had it so that they only paid half dues <laughs> for the servicemen while they were on active duty, so right. that he was very involved in that. He became the provincial Grand Master, but there was no record of him actually ever being invested as a Grand Master. He was... He was by appointment, I guess. Mm. You could say by appointment, because, even the rec because the <laughs> records were not quite so. I believe the existing uh, provincial Grand Master that, at the time was actually domiciled in Australia, and mm. he didn't really come to New Zealand. He has a, went to New Plymouth, and spent a couple of years in New Plymouth, and he helped in establishing the lodge down in New Plymouth for the Irish Constitution, and that was named the De Berg Adams Lodge. Which is incredible. Isn't and it? it still exists today, over 150 years later. Yeah. And he is, as far as I'm aware, the only person who has had a name, a lodge named after him whilst he is still alive. He went back to England and he died at age 39 yeah. from something that we take for granted today, uncomfortable to have, but they can fix. He died from a stomach ulcer, but in those days they couldn't fix it. To this day, there is a De Berg Adams Lodge in Taranaki, New Zealand, and there are pictures of him, large pictures, in galleries in London. Isn't this great? And that was mean? that was something that was reported in the newspaper. We don't see <laughs> that today, but he was a very influential man and a in a quiet, unassuming way, and not a lot of people know the influence that he actually had De here Berg in New Zealand. Adams, right? De Major Henry de Berg Henry Adams. Great choice, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, mate. Great choice. See, See you next week. week. Well, that's our show for this week. Thank you for joining us. Remember, if you'd like to know anything about Freemasonry, please do go to the Freemasons website, which is freemasonsnewzealand.org.nz, or otherwise just call the telephone number listed on the screen. Until I see you again, have a great week. Thank you.